Laboratory Complex, 1954. Some plasmid effects proved to be more difficult than we expected, Bridget Tenenbaum said, leading Fontaine down the hallway. Su Chong was leaning out an open door, gesturing for them to come. Su Chong is ready now for demonstration. Feeling a bit sick inside, but determined to see this through, Fontaine followed Tenenbaum to the lab's experimentation room. As they entered, Fontaine saw it was the same experimental subject as last time, the fellow Broham. But now he was awake, though not entirely awake. His eyes were open and flicking about. They were in Lab 3 of Fontaine Futuristics, an almost bare room but for a cabinet, a brush steel table of instruments, and an examination bed fitted with restraints. Steel walls were textured with rust and rivets. The room smelled of antiseptics and seawater leakage. He heard it dripping between the walls. A single naked electric light bulb glowed in the middle of the ceiling. The floor was covered with what looked to Fontaine like a thin carpet of black rubber. You guys don't go in for extras, do you? Fontaine observed. Maybe a little decoration. We will add more equipment later, Su Chong said, bending over the table. Decorations are superfluous. He selected a syringe and set about drawing a glowing blue fluid from a beaker. The man on the table looked at the syringe with frightened eyes. He writhed and made a mewing sound. In time, Su Chong will add computers, such other devices. Computers? Fontaine asked. What's a computer? Like adding machine, Su Chong said putting alcohol on Broham's shoulder. But faster, smarter, Mr. Ryan has designs. We can take to Fontaine Futuristics. Now, injecting the solution we call Eve, it will activate the Adam we have already incorporated into him. He injected Broham's shoulder with Eve. The man strapped to the table groaned and tried to pull away. Su Chong relentlessly drove the syringe plunger home. We are ready. Su Chong said, please back away from subject. All three of them backed away from the man on the exam table, all the way to the door. The subject was muttering to himself, visibly quivering in the leather restraints, shuddering, shaking, until shaking became convulsing. He shrieked and his back arched, bones audibly creaking. Fontaine was afraid the guy was going to snap his own spine. It's coming out of me. It's coming out of me. It, it's, it's coming out of me. Broham shrieked. Then there was a sizzling sound, the smell of ozone and burning flesh, and blue electricity arced up, passing from the man's restrained hands to his head, the arc crackling for a moment. Then it snapped up at the electric light, which burst and then went out. The room went dark, black as the pit of hell. What the devil? Fontaine said. As if the devil in question were responding to Fontaine, a reddish-blue glow surged up again, much brighter now, illuminating the room. The exam room strobed in and out of visibility, Broham's hands hissing great fat sparks that blackened the walls. The only light source was the eerie glow generated by the man on the table. A hissing sound filled the room. The glow in the man's eyes began to pulse. Fontaine shook his head, not at all certain of what he'd gotten himself into. He realized he should have brought Reggie. Maybe Lance, too. Doctor, Tenenbaum shouted. The tranquilizer. Fontaine saw for the first time that Su Chong had something ready in his hand. It looked like a gun, but when he fired it at the man on the exam table, it made a soft spitting sound, and there was no muzzle flash. The man yelped and Fontaine saw a dart of some kind had shot into the man's hip, where it waggled with his movements. Those movements calmed, and the light diminished as the electrical glow ebbed away. You see, Su Chong said, when mine shut down, his power too shut down. We should have insulated that light bulb, Tenenbaum said, reaching back to open the door as the last of the electrical shine vanished. The light from the hall indirectly illuminated the chamber, and the three of them approached Broham, who once more seemed semi-conscious, moving his head gently from side to side. 
The experimental subject seemed relatively unhurt to Fontaine's surprise, though the man's hospital gown was reduced to charred threads. He should have gotten burned, shouldn't he? With all that electricity shooting around in him. Maybe he's all burned inside himself? Tenenbaum shook her head as she examined the experimental subject, taking his pulse. No, he is not burned. This is part of plasmid phenomenon. He emanates the electricity, but is not harmed by it. Not exactly harmed. So, what's the practical use of this stuff? Fontaine demanded. How are we gonna make money on it? Tenenbaum shrugged. Can be used to start engines, galvanize equipment that is missing power, yes? Looking closer, Fontaine saw there was a mark on Broem. Around his eyes, not exactly scar tissue, but more like a thickening of the skin, a cancer-like growth across his face. Radiating outward from his eyes was a fanciful mask of thickened red tissue. You notice the extraneous tissue, Su Chong said, nodding. Does not seem lethal, but it is curious. Some subjects have more than others. Some of them? How many of these guys do you have? A few still alive. Come, this way. He led the way from the chamber. Fontaine was glad to get out of there. He might have gotten fried during that demonstration. So, what did we just see? That was a plasmid, right? He added wonderingly. Lightning. Coming out of a man. Dr. Suchong paused in the barren metal corridor under a naked yellow light and rubbed his hands together. Fontaine and Tenenbaum lingered with him in the hall, all of them a little shaken up. Fontaine glanced through an open door into a small cluttered lab where one of the nondescript sea slugs squirmed in a bubbling aquarium on a table, seething with fluid-filled tubes. Suchong is most impressed by plasmid possibilities. Powerful electric charge drawn from atmosphere can be used to activate machines or attack enemies. Maybe for self-defense against sharks when our men work in sea. That Broem, he cannot control it, but soon, Su Chong will improve stem cell communication with nervous system. Soon, a man can control this power, and other powers. Fontaine found that his pulse was racing with a mounting excitement. What are the powers? We have found special genes can be changed with stem alteration, using Adam so a man has power to project cold as Broem project lightning, power to project fire to project rage to make things move with power of mind alone. Fontaine looked at him. Was he in earnest or, or was this a cell job? Was Su Chong trying to con him? But he'd just seen a sample of plasmid power. If that's true, Adam is the ultimate score. Adam and Eve, it's, it's fucking amazing. Tenenbaum nodded, looking through the door at the sea slug in the aquarium. Yes, the little sea slug has come along and glued together all the crazy ideas I've had since the war. It can resurrect cells, bend the double helix, so that black can be reborn white, tall can be short, weak can become strong. But we are just beginning. There is more we need, Frank. Much more. Fontaine grinned and winked at her. You'll get whatever you need. Fontaine Futuristics will transform. Rapture, I feel it in my bones. Tenenbaum looked curiously at Fontaine. Right at him. But he suspected she could look right at him only because she was thinking of him as a specimen. Really. You feel that in your bones. No, that's just an expression. What I'm saying is, this is going to go big, and it's got to be presented big. I'm going to buy a space from Ryan Industries, and we're going to move Fontaine Futuristics out of this dump into the best design location in Rapture. It'll look like the inside of a mansion, with lots of decor and sculpture, so that people will sense the power behind those doors. He broke off, shaking his head, thinking that he was starting to sound like a businessman. Won't have to do it long, he told himself. The bunko possibilities in this one are all about selling something to people they only think they want until they've got it. And once they got it, it's got them. Meaning, 
I'll have them in my hip pocket. Su Chong glanced at the sea slug and licked his lips. Something was troubling him. But, Mr. Fontaine, there is danger. He looked gravely at Fontaine. Danger in using Adam and in developing plasmids. You should know before proceeding. Come this way, you shall see. They went down a metal-walled corridor, feet clumping in wooden planks. The air at this end smelled like raw chemicals and curdled human sweat. They came to a steel door stenciled, Special Studies. Keep out. Su Chong put his hand on the knob. Perhaps we should not go in, Bridget Tenenbaum said suddenly, not looking at either of them, but holding the door shut with the flat of her hand. She started to close the door. Why? Fontaine asked, wondering if they were planning to lock him up in there. It occurred to him that maybe he should be careful around scientists who strap random people to tables and inject them with things. It is dangerous inside, perhaps diseased. Fontaine swallowed, but he made up his mind. There can't be any part of this I don't know about. It's all my business. He wanted plasmids, bad, but he needed to know what the risks were, if this was something that exposed him too much. She nodded once and stepped back. Su Chong opened the door. Immediately, a disturbing, unnatural smell emanated from the room. It was a scent Fontaine would expect from exposed human brains when the top of the skull was sawed away. His stomach lurched, but he followed Su Chong one step, just one, into the room. We tried to mix some genes from sea creatures with human, Su Chong was saying. Give man powers of certain animals, but the musty, ill-lit rectangular chamber was about 35 feet by 30 but it seemed smaller because of the shifting heap of the thing that dominated it. Clinging to the walls opposite Fontaine was something that might have once been human. It was as if someone had taken human flesh and made it as malleable as clay. Bones and flesh made pliable and plastered it onto the wall. Beaded with sweat, the mass of human flesh seemed to simply cling there, spread over two walls in a corner, a bloated face muttering to itself at the center of the creature near the ceiling. Several human organs were exposed, including a heart and kidneys, damp and quivering, dangling like meat in a butchery from crust-edged gaps in its body. The creature's big limbs... What the hell? Fontaine blurted. The thing's beak clicked and muttered in response. Fontaine turned and dashed from the room. He went five paces down the hall and, feeling dizzy, gagging, came to a stumbling stop. Leaning against Rapture's cold metal bulkhead, he felt a surge of relief when he heard the door of the special studies room clang shut. Tenenbaum and Su Chong strolled up beside him. Su Chong, with his hands casually in his coat pockets, looking faintly amused. Tenenbaum seemed almost humanly concerned for him. So, <laughs> you got this process under control or not? We do, now, Tenenbaum said, looking thoughtfully at the yellow overhead light. Yes, we will not be producing more of those. Then, I want you to do something for me. Kill that thing in the incinerated. No traces left. I want no bad publicity. I want more plasmids like the one that makes lightning, but, but more variety. More controllable. Easy to package. Stuff that makes a man smarter, stronger. The stuff that makes us money. You understand? Money. Ryan Amusements. Rapture Memorial Museum. 1954. Stanley Poole stood at the outer edge of the small crowd, waiting for Dr. Lamb to begin. Discreetly passed out flyers in Maintenance Station 17 and Apollo Square advertised a free public lecture by eminent psychiatrist Dr. Sophia Lamb on a new hope for the working man. The lanky, swan-necked blonde in the modish horn rims stepped up in front of the museum's Rapture Grows tableau with its stylized images of Rapture's founding workers. She gazed at the crowd like a prophetess, her benevolent expression condescending but motherly. 
her smile infinitely knowing. She pressed the button to start the museum tableau's recording. A friendly male voice intoned, After the platform is secured, work progresses at an astounding rate. Designed to be the foundation of rapture, workers toil around the clock to create the metropolis you see today. Do you hear that? She clasped her hands behind her back and chuckled ironically, making eye contact with the small crowd, mostly low-level workers, all listening, raptly, though Poole realized that Simon Wales was there too. That's recording, Sophia Lamb went on, is a compact little insight into rapture. Workers toil around the clock to create the metropolis. And in the Laying the Foundation exhibit, right over there, what does the recording say? Her voice was mockingly arch as she recited, Engineers work to overcome obstacles such as diamond hard rock, obstinate sea life, and unexpected casualties. Think about it, my friends. How much needless suffering have we taken for granted? She shook her head sadly. Unexpected casualties. Oh, Andrew Ryan fully expected them. He just didn't care. A great many lives were lost in the building of Rapture. Those lives were sacrificed to the god that is the human ego. Ryan's ego. The common man and woman in Rapture is overlooked and underpaid. They're left exhausted. They toiled around the clock to create this city. But how much of what they created do they really share in? What did Andrew Ryan really offer but paper? A little something called rapture dollars. Mere documents, paper money, paper for paupers, and a precious little of that. Who, I ask you, really owns rapture? The people who built it, or the plutocrats who control it? The many, or the few? You know the answer. A good many in the crowd were nodding. Some frowned, unsure, but most seemed convinced. They'd been thinking something of the sort themselves, Poole supposed. Here was someone who said it right out loud. Dr. Sophia Lamb, a psychiatrist, using her psychology on the common man. This woman Lamb is becoming troublesome, Poole, Ryan had said. See what she's up to. Stay discreet. If Ryan could hear this, Poole thought. He'd blow his carefully barbered top. Sophia Lamb paused thoughtfully, then pointed at the ornate walls. Rapture looks like a great big palace at times, doesn't it? It abounds in luxury, but where's housing for those who maintain it? You're crowded into places like Maintenance 17, but that's traditional in a palace, isn't it? There are the luxury quarters for the elites, and then there's the little cubby holes under the stairs where the servants live. Palace servants have always outnumbered kings and queens, yet we blindly continue to serve them. My vision of a new, united rapture is revolutionary, yes, revolutionary, I say it proudly. And yet I'm bringing this new spirit of cooperation, my friends, a new shape for love, Cooperation in a place like Ryan's Rapture is transformative, and the world I'm bringing is a sacrament, the beginning of a new church of cooperation. I have had an inspiration that seems to come from some cosmic place of certainty, and it is telling me that Rapture's foundation on competition is cracking. Competition is division, my friends. A house divided cannot stand. As she spoke, Poole noticed she became more intense. Her nostrils flared, her eyes flashed, her hands fisted. She radiated charisma just as Ryan did, but her magnetism was somehow powerfully maternal. Poole glanced at Simon Wales and noticed he seemed totally captivated by Lamb. She went on, declaring loudly, We must evolve to heal Rapture. We will heal it by redesigning it from within. We will create a true utopia, and utopians fit to live in utopia. We will build a unity that will thrive, even as the surface world fails. But the new rapture will not be based on greed. It will be a collective based on sharing. What is the collective? It is the body of rapture. 
therein will lie its truth. An end to the burden of mindless competition, a turning to cooperation, altruism, community, and communality. Holy cow, Poole thought. Ryan was going to flip. The boss was caught between a rock and a hard place. Ryan was officially against censorship, so how could he censor this woman? But from what Poole had heard about the secret structures being expanded in the Persephone project, Ryan had a plan for taking care of the Red organizers. As the speech ended, he turned away and spotted someone at the back of the crowd he hadn't noticed here before. A man with dark glasses and a hat covering his bald head. Poole knew him, despite the man's attempt at going incognito. It was Frank Fontaine, and Fontaine had a mighty, thoughtful look on his face. Frank Fontaine wasn't aware of Poole watching him. He was mesmerized by Sophia Lamb. The woman's amazing, Fontaine thought. What a con artist. She was a grifter with two or three college degrees. He had to admire her. What is the collective? She'd said. It is the body of rapture. Good stuff. You could plug almost any feeling you wanted into that. Conning one guy at a time wasn't much challenge, but a whole crowd. Conning a whole population. Man, that was a thing of beauty. This lamb woman knew how you got the people on your side. Figure out what was bothering them and use it as a kind of harness. And pretty soon, they're pulling your wagon for you. Smart. But that's traditional in a palace, isn't it? There are the luxury quarters for the elites, and then there's the little cubby holes under the stairs where the servants live. Palace servants have always outnumbered kings and queens. Smart. Give them something to repeat to one another. We're like the palace servants living under the stairs, see? This Dr. Lamb was going to be too much competition, of course. In time, he'd have to see to it that Ryan got the info he needed to arrest her. Meantime, she was inspiring him, along with the crowd. Only not the same way. He'd do it all his way, of course. She was kind of the female version. His own version of radical leadership would be very different. Maybe it was too early to really get going on it, but he could start to plant the seeds, get it growing, and in time, harvest. Andrew Ryan's Office, 1954. Bill found Andrew Ryan at his desk. Mr. Ryan, I have that maintenance report. Ryan glanced up. Oh, Bill, have a seat. He looked back at the folder in his hands, and Bill sat down across from him. The folder was marked confidential. I just want to have another look at the end of this one. I had Stanley Poole look into some things. This lamb woman is a problem. He flipped the page. Bringing that woman in was bad judgment. He grunted to himself, closed the folder, pushed it aside, and opened another. Yes, Poole's also found out something about Fontaine's new venture. He's calling futuristics. Seems quite pregnant with possibility. Take a load off while I sort through this. Ryan made notes, nodded to himself, then looked up at Bill, smiling. I get so caught up in the day-to-day -day business, I forget to really take a look at the people around me. You look a bit careworn, Bill. That's, that's natural. How's Elaine? Bill smiled, relaxing a little. He liked to see this side of Ryan. Grand, Mr. Ryan. Knows how to make a man happy, that one. Good, good. I too will settle down when the time comes. I dream of having a son one day, you know. Someone to take what I've built in his hands and keep it thriving. Build on it. An investment in the future. What a wonderful place to grow up, Rapture is too. A wonderland for kids, I should think. Bill wasn't so sure of that. Not at all, but he only smiled musingly and nodded. Sullivan came bustling in. He nodded to Bill and stood behind the desk with a tense air of a man who was fitting this stop into a tight schedule. You called me, sir? Ah, chief. There you are, yes. He pushed the folder towards Sullivan. I need you to jump with both feet into this. Have you heard something about a new development called plasmids? Plasmids? No, sir. What the blazes are they? Some kind of product. Look at this. 
He reached into a desk drawer, drew out a folded copy of the Rapture Tribune, and laid it on the desk for Bill and Sullivan to see. It was opened to the back page, on which an advertisement proclaimed, Everything you always wanted to be, you can be, with plasmids, the wave of the future from Fontaine Futuristics. Free samples of Hair Grow, Brain Boost, Sport Boost, Electro Bolt, Brute More Muscle Enhancer, and watch for Incinerate. Ryan shrugged. Fontaine is putting them out. Grows new hair, new teeth, makes you prettier, stronger, younger, even faster. Already selling big to the maintenance workers. A genetic breakthrough, according to Poole. Our restless young rival is at it again. I want you to find out what you can about these plasmids, Sullivan, and everything about Fontaine Futuristics. Apparently, he's hired Dr. Suchong and Bridget Tenenbaum to develop these projects. That woman seemed unstable to me, but she's a whiz. Bill looked at the advertisement and shook his head. Too good to be true, isn't it? I mean, got to be side effects. They test these things first. Ryan waved a hand dismissively. I'm not really concerned with weighing down progress with a lot of testing. People want to try it, they can take their chances. Well, Sullivan, can you take this on? Poole's got his hands full watching that lamb woman. Sullivan rubbed his jaw. Working on that uh, smuggling thing pretty hard right now, sir. Fontaine's changed his MO. We'll take care of their smuggling later, unless you have solid proof it's Fontaine. No, sir, not arresting proof, of course. The constables would probably arrest anybody. You told them to. Ryan leaned back in his desk chair, seemed to consider it, then shook his head. No, if I did that, we'd be no better than the Reds. No, we'll get evidence, but first, I want to know what this plasmid thing is all about. My instinct tells me it's something that could change Rapture's marketplace. Sullivan nodded, ran a hand through his hair, licking his lips as if he were thinking of bringing up another issue. Then he shrugged it off. I'm on it, sir. He headed out the door, a man on a mission. How are those leaking problems I've been hearing about, Bill? Ryan asked, though the glazed look in his eyes suggested his thoughts were roving elsewhere. Constant maintenance, Gov. The bloody sea doesn't just sit quiet out there. We'll push it out of our way, it pushes right back. Always throwing its weight around, sheer water pressure currents. Change in temperature, ice formation, sea creatures are scraping and squeezing. Barnacles and starfish and sea worms had to send scraping crews out twice the last month. Yes, yeah, some men spend so much time in deep sea diving suits they're beginning to feel like part of them. Ryan smiled to himself. Bill remembered the experimental subject he'd seen in the labs. Not something he wanted to think about. Ryan tossed the pencil on the desk, tented his fingers and scowled broodingly. Fontaine is shaping up to be my great rival here. He can only sharpen me. It is like fuel for the fire of my talent, but I cannot let him come to fully dominate the marketplace in Rapture. No, I may have to take action. We may have to get tough with Mr. Fontaine. Maintenance Station 17, early 1955. It was right depressing, visiting the old maintenance workers' colony. Bill McDonough didn't like coming here. It made him feel obscurely guilty as he walked along from the metro passage to the back of the pawn shop at the corner, picking his way past moraines of trash. Bill felt responsible for rapture. He sure hadn't planned on any slums. Someone had written, Welcome to Pauper's Drop, in red across one wall in dripping paint. Below it, a long tatty row of sullen ingredients squatted against the metal bulkhead, shivering, some of them in carapaces of cardboard. The heating duct for this area was blocked, and the few merchants down here were reluctant to pay the Ryan Industries service fee for getting them unblocked. Bill had come down to do it in his spare time. Not that he would tell Ryan that, if Ryan knew he was doing charity work. Bill had gotten Roland Wallace to help each swearing the other to secrecy, and Wallace promised he'd bring an electrician along, but neither Wallace nor his wire jockey were here now. Bill was beginning to feel nervous about being here alone. The surly unemployed along the wall watched his every step. He heard them muttering as he went along. One of them said, She's watching him too. 
He was relieved to see Roland Wallace at the corner. With Wallace was a bearded man in overalls carrying a toolbox, a tall, gaunt man with an aquiline profile. Oi, Bill called, his breath steaming from the chill. Wallace. Wallace saw him and waved. Bill hurried to him. I'm bloody well glad to see you, mate, Bill said, keeping his voice low. These ragamuffins over here been giving me the gimlet eye, half expecting a knock on the head. Wallace nodded, looking past him at the ill-kempt men and women along the wall, many with bottles in hand. Drinking, too, a lot of them. No rules against making your own in rapture. Someone's been selling cheap absinthe to this bunch I hear. Three people died from bad hooch, and two went blind. Ugh. Well, come on. The best way into the duct is in the back of the pawn shop. Glad to get the heat working here. It's damn cold. The electrician said nothing, though it seemed to Bill that the man was muttering to himself under his breath, his hawkish, deep-set eyes darting this way and that. Bill noticed thick red blotches on the man's forehead. They stepped over small piles of trash and went around a quite large one to get to the back of the pawn shop. There's no trash pickup here either? Bill asked. We can't afford it. You live down here too. Why do you think I'm doing this job for free? The electrician said, clipping the words. His tone dripped venom. Need the heat. Can't get into the ducks without you. Ryan Industries types along. Not if I don't want the constables after me. Bill nodded and thumped on the back door of the pawn shop. Who is it? Called a gruff voice from inside. Bill McDonough, looking for Arno Dukmagian. You got my jet postal? Yeah, yeah, come on in. The man who opened the brass sheath door looked as gruff as his voice sounded. He was a squat-faced man in a rumpled suit with a scar through his lower lip. His arms were too long for his suit jacket. His hair was bristly short. Yeah, I am Arno Duke Mage, and this here is my shop. Come in, come in, if you have to. The three men entered the dusty, dimly lit back room, where there was barely enough room to move about. Piled floor to ceiling were appliances, radios, ladies' shoes, gowns, boxes of guns, boxes of watches, silver picture frames, anything that could be hocked. I've cleared off the trap door, Duke Magian said. This place was built right over it. Building over the trap door might have been a violation of some building regulation up on the surface, Bill figured, but in Rapture, there were almost no building regulations. Wallace had the key. He knelt on the metal floor and opened the trap door as the electrician held an electric torch for him. The light slanted down to reveal a grimy iron shaft and a rusty ladder. A sickening smell rose up from the shaft. Must be something dead down there, Bill said. He climbed down as the electrician held the light. It got a little colder each step he descended. The other two joined him at the bottom, and they ducked to enter a tunnel, the electrician going first to light the way. The reek of death was growing stronger. They had to move along, hunched over. The tunnel was about eight inches too low to stand up in. If they're going to make it big enough for a short man, why can't they make it big enough for a tall man? The electrician grumbled. It ain't that much more. Just 30 echoing steps in, where the tunnel narrowed to a large pipe, they found the source of the smell and the cause of the obstruction. A body was jammed in the heating duct. It appeared to be the partly mummified body of a boy, perhaps 12 or 13, lying face down in the vent pipe. He wore ragged clothing, and his black hair was matted with old dried blood. A large fan blade pitted with rust, had sliced partway through his neck. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ, Bill muttered. Poor little blighter. Wallace was gagging. It took him a few moments to get his composure. Bill had seen enough death in the war and in the building of Rapture, and he was almost inured to it. Almost. Still, he felt a deep queasiness, looking at the shriveled hands of the child, clutching at the tunnel wall, as if frozen in a last attempt at reaching out for life. I reckon, Bill said, his voice a bit hoarse. The kid was exploring, and the fans not on all the time. It was off, and he tried to crawl past, and that's when it came on. 
The electrician nodded. Yeah, but he wasn't exploring. Didn't have any place to live. One of the orphans. Nobody took him in, so he came down into the tunnels to sleep where he'd be safe. Maybe he got lost. The orphans? Bill asked. Quite a few, are there? There's some, hereabout. People come here, work, and then they finish a project and the bosses lay them off. No more work, but they're not allowed to leave Rapture either, so they start a fight over food and such, kill one another, and now, with these plasmids, some people don't know how to handle them. Got to know how, surely do. If you don't, you might get a little carried away. Leave some orphans. There ought to be an orphanage, Wallace said. The electrician chuckled grimly. Think Ryan can figure out how to run one for a profit? Someone will start one. We get enough orphans, Bill said. Well, let's move him. See if we can get this thing started. Glad to leave the impromptu metal tomb, Wallace volunteered to get the necessary items. He hurried back to the ladder, returning a few minutes later with a large burlap sack and extra gloves. Kid's kind of shriveled. I, I, I suppose we can get him in this? Grimacing, they worked the child's body free of the jam, carefully blocking the blades with a hammer from the toolbox in case they should decide to start running. But after they'd gotten the dried-out husk of a child removed and stuffed the desiccated body into the burlap sack and removed the hammer, the vent blades were still motionless. The electrician opened a panel near the fan and made some adjustments inside with a tool. He squirted lubricant in and used a small device to test for current. It's live over there, but I'm going to have to give it a jolt to get it going. Some parts sat too long, rusted inside. Stand back. He stretched his left hand out towards the panel, seemed to concentrate for a moment. His eyes glowed faintly, and a small lightning bolt shot blue-white from his hand and crackled into the open panel. Startled, Bill straightened suddenly and banged his head on the ceiling. Bloody bugger hell. Electrobolt plasmid, Wallace muttered. Holy, Bill said, rubbing his head. They just fucking... Then he realized that the fan was whirring, blowing warm air into his face. That'll do it, the electrician said. When this one stopped, the other ones stopped too. Should all be working now. He turned and glared at Bill, and there was still a bit of glow in his eyes, so that he looked like a feral animal in the tunnel dimness. You just gotta know how to handle them. See? He said. The plasmids. Then he picked up his tools and started back to the ladder.